This is the true, never-before-told history of the Outlaws Motorcycle Club in the United States of America as well as the club's evolution and its influence on the earliest days of Outlaw Motorcycle Club culture in the USA. It is important to note that everything in this video comes from stories that have been handed down generation to generation over the past three quarters of a century or better. If you disagree with the history that is relayed in this video and have viable evidence to the contrary then I encourage you to share it. Again, the story told in this video is a story that has been told generation after generation and ultimately told to me. I have yet to hear this story told in the way it was told to me anywhere else and so I will be telling it here so that everyone of today can have a better understanding of the history of this club and the culture that they and other clubs ultimately fathered. The story begins with the invention of the motorcycle in the United States. The motorized cycle may have been invented elsewhere before it ever reached the USA. But the motorcycle in the United States was invented right around the turn of the century. A company called Indian Motorcycle got started in 1901 in Massachusetts when a bicycle company called Hendy Bicycles set out to motorize their bicycles. Then in 1903 Arthur Davidson, Walt Davidson and William Harley built the first Harley-Davidson motorcycle in a shed in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. In those early days, enough of the American public fell in love with the invention of the motorcycle that both companies quickly realized the potential for the creation of a market for the new invention. From the very beginning the two motorcycle companies were in constant competition with each other, which fueled a steady flow of innovation from both of them to continue bettering the motorcycle in every way possible. Racing their motorcycles against each other gave both companies the opportunity to showcase their innovations while marketing their brands at the same time. By the time World War I came around in 1914, both companies had grown substantially and had made great strides in the field of motorcycle engineering. So when Uncle Sam came knocking they were both eager to make contributions to the war effort for the armed forces of the United States of America. Both companies made great contributions. Harley-Davidson opted to donate much of their production to the war effort as did Indian and in the true spirit of the competition between the two companies, Arthur Davidson opted to one-up Indian by coming up with the idea of creating a program for the United States military where schools would be placed throughout the country for the soldiers to learn how to take apart, put back together and maintain Harley-Davidson motorcycles during wartime. After these young men had gone off to fight in World War I, they returned as war-hardened veterans that had learned how to service maintain and repair Harley-Davidson motorcycles while under fire. They had arguably become some of the most skilled riders and mechanics in the world at that time. Their passion for riding and racing motorcycles continued upon their return to the United States. It was around that time in 1924 that an organization was created in Ohio called the American Motorcyclist Association, better known as the AMA. The AMA was an organization that sought to capitalize on the popularity of the relatively new invention of the motorcycle. Their goal was to monopolize the sport of motorcycle racing and competition. They achieved that goal and their organization was very successful. But they quickly came to the conclusion that their greatest obstacle would be marketing the new sport to the American public. An American public that at the time was for the most part very conservative. The AMA knew that motorcycle racing was a rough sport that attracted a rough crowd. So they felt that their greatest shot at marketing the sport to the American public would be to maintain strict conservative values within their organization. They did so by creating a strict set of rules and standards that their participants were to follow and uphold. When the AMA was created, many of the World War I veterans that had gone through the Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Repair Program in the military showed up to participate in the AMA's events. Their love of riding motorcycles continued after the war and the AMA seemed like a perfect place for them to utilize their skills and harness their passion for riding motorcycles in a positive setting. However, when the AMA began implementing strict conservative rules and standards, the AMA and many of the, the motorcycle riding veterans began to clash. Because though the veterans were extremely skilled mechanics and riders, many of them did not live up to the AMA's standards. 
The veterans had tattoos, they sometimes grew their hair and facial hair out, they liked to drink and have fun, they created clubs and racing teams using names of squadrons from the war and names that reflected their love of having a good time. Their motorcycles were loud, fast, and powerful. All of these things combined made them the number one enemy of the AMA's conservative marketing campaign. So the AMA implemented rules against such names and emblems being used by AMA-sanctioned racing teams and they also implemented strict grooming and uniform policies as well as rules governing the behavior of participants. So when many of the veterans and younger participants were not able to live up to the newly implemented rules and standards, many were banned from participating in AMA events. Once the AMA began banning participants, many of them, who also happened to be veterans of the First World War and graduates of the Harley-Davidson Motorcycle Maintenance Program took the stance of, Fine. Your races and events aren't any fun anyway. You can all stay here with your holier-than-thou attitude and we're gonna go build our own tracks and have our own races. We're better riders and mechanics than anyone you've got here anyway, and we're not gonna stop people from having a good time when they come to our events. So throughout the Midwest, and eventually the entire country, young people began holding their own motorcycle events out in the countryside. In rebellion of the AMA's tactics, the folks that had been banned from the AMA's events, that were now hosting their own races and events, encouraged a free-spirited atmosphere where riders and young people could have a good time and form whatever kind of clubs or race teams they wanted to. Because of this, this new underground motorcycle racing circuit not only represented everything the AMA was against at the time, but it also became a viable competitor for them. So the AMA responded by holding steadfast to their conservative values and mounting a propaganda campaign against the new underground circuit. They used their political connections to send law enforcement after the hosts of the non-sanctioned events on the grounds that the events were being held with no permits, no insurance, and no emergency medical personnel. Then, they let all of their event attendees know to stay away from any clubs, teams, races, or events that had not been sanctioned by the AMA because all such events had been outlawed. That term of outlawed races and events ended up having an unintended snowball effect that continues to this very day. The term outlawed events led to the label of outlaws being attached to all clubs and race teams that had not been sanctioned by the AMA this then led to groups throughout the Midwest that had been banned by the AMA being referred to as outlaws. Young attendees of the underground American motorcycle circuit of the time could be heard discussing where and by who the next underground races would be hosted. Things such as I heard the outlaws in Milwaukee are doing a flat track race this weekend. Next weekend the Detroit outlaws are doing a hill climb. Then in 1935 a group that hung out in a bar called Matilda's on Old Route 66 in McCook, Illinois took it to the next level by having the name embroidered onto their jackets labeling themselves the McCook Outlaws and despite the free-spirited attitude of the underground motorcycle movement there was always a code of respect and etiquette. So once the name Outlaws was embraced by that group and embroidered onto their attire, it was quickly understood and respected by all the other so-called outlaw groups that as far as the vast majority of clubs were concerned, the name now belonged to the group from McCook. And so the Outlaws Motorcycle Club was born. Then in 1941 the world found itself at war yet again. This time it was World War II, and just like in World War I, Harley Davidson continued their noteworthy contribution to the war effort, and this time a whole new generation of young servicemen went through the new and improved Harley Davidson motorcycle maintenance program in the U.S. military. By the time the graduates of the second generation of the Harley Davidson service program in the military began returning from the war, the rebellion against the AMA and ultra conservative practices in America was in full swing yet again. The group from McCook decided to relocate to Chicago where they changed their name from the McCook Outlaws to the Chicago Outlaws. Shortly thereafter they replaced their winged motorcycle patch with a simple patch of a skull. Meanwhile in 1947 across the country in California a similar rebellion against the AMA and its practices was taking place and ultimately culminated in what later became known as the Hollister Riot. In 1954 a movie was made that had been inspired by the so-called Hollister Riot. The movie, starring Marlon Brando, was called The Wild One and featured a club whose emblem consisted of a skull and crossed pistons. Influenced by the movie, 
The Chicago Outlaws then added the Cross Pistons below their skull patch and Charlie, as their patch became known, was born. Shortly thereafter, true to their original cause of rebelling against what they considered to be the tyrannical practices of the AMA, the Outlaws adopted a mock AMA chest patch. The AMA's patch was a triangle with rounded off points and a spiral design in the center. The mock AMA patch created by the Outlaws or the Answer as it later became known featured a similar triangle. But instead of having AMA in the triangle, it had an A and O and an A which stands for American Outlaws Association, and so as to leave no doubt about the purpose and origin of the mock patch, the Outlaws replaced the AMA spiral design with a prominent design of a hand putting up its middle finger. The patch is a clear representation of the club's history built on rebelling against tyranny in the name of true freedom. From there the club continued to grow in the Midwest, absorbing other smaller clubs that saw true brotherhood and true freedom in the outlaws and ultimately found their home among them. In the early 1960s members of the outlaws traveled west and met up with another titan in the world of American motorcycle clubs, the Hells Angels. It was then that the outlaws were accepted into the 1% or Brotherhood of Clubs and became the first recognized 1% club east of the Mississippi. Fast forward a few years and the United States found itself at war once again. This time it was Vietnam. This was an unpopular war in the United States. Unlike the two previous wars, this time when the veterans returned home they were not greeted with a hero's welcome. They were spit on and called names as they stepped off the plane onto American soil. This is when the outlaws and the entire American motorcycle club culture took a huge turn in the wrong direction. Many of the members in the late 60s were veterans of the Vietnam conflict and couldn't find jobs upon their return because much of the American public had turned their back on any participants of the unpopular Vietnam conflict. So... The young veteran motorcycle club members used the resources they had available to them at the time to survive. Manpower, motorcycles, weapons training, tactical assault training, and a host of other skills that formed a perfect storm to create an extremely effective criminal syndicate in the outlaws and other clubs like them. The outlaws eventually spread into Florida and a number of other states and have been in a battle with the Justice Department and territorial disputes with other organizations ever since. The organized criminal activity forced the outlaws to carve out their own pieces of territory which they always defended fiercely. Because of territorial disputes and other conflicts the 1970s through the 2000s were very violent times for the outlaws. Their massive expansion, their quest for money and their conflicts with other clubs, at least for a time, turned the outlaws into the very same kind of tyrannical force that they as a club were created in rebellion of. All those years ago. Thankfully, the true ways of the original outlaws have always lived on and were always handed down to the right people along the way. Things will always come full circle and the true way of the original outlaws will live on in the hearts of true one percenters until the end of time. If you found this video informative please like and subscribe and I will continue to produce more like it. Thank you for watching.